Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MindSpeak. It's a real pleasure today to be uh, hosting Stephen Jennings, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him in a moment. Um, it's been a real privilege to be part of this journey of MindSpeak. We've had some tremendous guests, and Stephen is, is one of those tremendous guests that I'm really excited uh, to be hosting today. Many years ago, when I first started out my career at Credit Suisse First Boston, uh, Stephen was there already, and as I made my way to the trading floor, he had a legendary reputation, and he took off um, in the early 90s to Moscow to set up an investment bank, and I'm going to tell you, tell you that story. In 1998, I reminded Stephen when I saw him last time, he threw a fantastic party on the river in Moscow that I went to, which was really one of the best parties I've ever been on, Stephen. And I, I'm hoping you're going to throw another one soon. <laughs> So if I can just give you a bit of background, um, Stephen is the founder and CEO of Rendeva, um, has been living and working in emerging markets for over 20 years, is a pioneer of capital markets in Central and Eastern Europe and Africa, responsible for over $200 billion of investment flows to these regions, that's a fact. As the founder and CEO of Rendeva, Mr. Jennings manages the land portfolio and projects of Africa's largest urban developer. With over 12,000 hectares, 30,000 acres of urban land near high growth cities in Kenya, uh, which is Tartu City, um, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, and the DRC. Mr. Jennings founded Renaissance Group in 1995 building investment banking, security sales and trading, asset management and consumer finance businesses across Central and Eastern Europe, Asia and Africa. Uh, producing more than 3,000 research reports in Africa, Renaissance's notable achievements on the continent include the first IPOs on several African exchanges. Since 2012, Mr. Jennings has focused on building a pan-African urban development business of which he is the majority shareholder, along with American and other international investors. During the period between 1983 and 1992, Mr. Jennings worked at Credit Suisse First Boston in New Zealand and in the New Zealand Treasury. He also consulted for the governments of New Zealand and Australia on issues of privatization holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Macy University and a master of economics first class from the University of Auckland. Mr. Jennings is featured in the recently published book, Bankers Who Changed the World, and I think he's the only person I know who's made a billion dollars more than three times that I know of. So, Mr. Jennings, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for those very generous and kind words, Ali Khan, and lovely to see you again. So tonight I'd like to talk about Tartu City, what the project stands for, and what is at stake for the citizens of Nairobi and Kenya in terms of what happens next with the project. And I'm going to do this in the context of the transformation that has occurred in many of the world's poorest countries in recent decades, and the sweeping changes now taking place right across sub-Saharan Africa. And I want to use this approach because I think taken together the global emerging market experience together with the nitty gritty of the Tartu story paints a very graphic picture of the defining challenges and choices facing Kenyan society today. As Ali Khan intimated, over the last 25 years I've witnessed at first hand tw transformational growth in a number of countries and regions, including Africa. And that transformation is based around a virtuous cycle involving the adoption of market principles and, and increasing political pressure for improved governance. The economic recipe for transformational growth is almost universally understood in emerging markets today and is, has proven very effective in a wide range of countries and institutional settings. Accordingly, it's impacting the lives of a greater proportion of the world's population than, any than at any time in history. And Africa is part, is part of that transformation as anywhere else. 
parts of Africa will benefit or not as much as Asia, Latin America, BRIC or Europe did. And any attempt to geographically confine the economic transformation taking place globally today is missing the point. The process is economic. Those regions of Africa which open themselves up to this process will benefit as much as anywhere else globally. The winners will be decided by the political commitment to change and modernisation, not by the geography. In fact, I see the opportunity in Africa as greater than anywhere else in the world, frankly, by some margin. Not because Africa is different, but because it just isn't a special case. Many African countries will transfer, transform their economies in coming decades, just as most of Asia, Europe and America have done in their time. The difference with Africa is simply that the scope for convergence for, and catch up is greater and is likely to happen more rapidly. However, the convergence path of individual African countries is going to be highly idiosyncratic and organic. It will reflect each country's grassroots commitment to driving and sustaining modernization and openness rather than some idealised Western notion of top-down institutional reform. And to illustrate my point, I want to refer to a region of the world which was once infamous for having the poorest people, the lowest life expectancy, the most wars, and the most depressing outlook on Earth. And I'm not talking about Africa. I'm talking about Asia before its rapid development over recent decades back to the time when per capita GDP in China was less than $100 and incomes in South Korea were about one-fifth of those in Zaire. Because five decades ago, Asia was an economic basket case, more than 30 countries struggling to emerge from poverty. And very few indeed predicted then the economic powerhouses which would emerge or not, as the case may be. In the 50s and 60s, it was Asia that was considered the overpopulated, politically incompetent, war-riven basket case. Yet the widely accepted notion of universal prosperity across Asia today, of Asian values and the Asian century, is in fact a myth, at least when Asia is talked about as in homogenous terms. Yes, much of Asia has modernised and transformed living standards. China, Singapore, Taiwan and South Korea all fall into this category. The capita GDP of $80,000 in Singapore is a staggering achievement. But the Asian failures are equally staggering. Today, Nigeria has higher per capita income than India, Vietnam, Pakistan, Cambodia or Burma. And the Philippines is only marginally better. Indonesia and Sri Lanka have lower incomes than Namibia, Egypt or Botswana. So despite the fanfare and the massive regional growth opportunity, Asia is far from being a universal success story. There's an extremely interesting aspect of this disparity of performance across Asia and one that has profound implications for Africa and for that matter Kenya. In Asia many of the countries that were expected to do well didn't and vice versa. The Philippines and Burma, because of their historic ties to the US and Britain respectively, were once odds-on favourites, but not for long. China, where in one decade we were told that Confucianism is a barrier to capitalism, and in the next, experts extolled the Chinese work ethic, became a big winner. And South Korea has risen against all expectations from the embers of war to become an economic powerhouse. You can see the huge outperformance of South Korea in comparison with the Philippines, which was once a considerably wealthier country. There's an important message here for Africa and for Kenya. In the marathon to become a middle-income country, what matters is not a country's starting point, but its commitment to sustaining modernization and reform over many decades of change. For the last 10 years, Sub-Saharan Africa has been ongoing, undergoing a remarkably similar process of modernisation and development to that which commenced in Asia 50 years ago. 
And as the next slide, slide shows, similar to India in particular. Over the next 30 years, Sub-Saharan Africa is poised to experience similar growth to that in developing Asia over the last 30 years. Last year, the average growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, was just under 6%, the highest of any region globally, and is set to be slightly higher this year. Critically, African growth has been sustained despite the slowdown in the Western economies and the major BRIC economies. In fact, Sub-Saharan Africa and India are the only two regions in the world that are not suffering the rather perplexing and frightening slowdown in productivity that is afflict afflicting the rest of the world. Foreign direct investment is helping to spur growth. It is expected to reach 55 billion in 2015, 20% higher than in 2010. And inflows of capital are increasingly focused on less resource countries as investors target the continent's booming middle classes. Nearly 10 years ago, I began rolling out my investment bank, Renaissance Capital, across the region. Within a few years, we were the most active investment bank in sub-Saharan Africa and raised capital for clients in 22 separate countries. And as Ali Khan mentioned, we published over 3,000 research reports promoting the African growth story. Back then, the African rising narrative was regarded as a little bit far-fetched, and telling the story in an authoritative way had an important impact on investor understanding and appetite for investment in Africa. Unfortunately, it seems every success has its unintended side effects. The Africa rising narrative is now almost universally recognised and widely accepted. However, what concerns me today is that when I travel across our various businesses in the different regions of Africa, is the complacency and even expectation that Africa's growth can somehow be taken for granted and that most of Africa will continue to go, grow rapidly for decades to come, regardless of domestic commitment to change and modernization. This is an extremely dangerous illusion and one that will rapidly bear bitter fruit. Because as in Asia, only those countries with a deep and sustained commitment to reform and development will achieve middle income status. Many of the rest will remain desperately and depressingly poor. Also in Asia, I'm absolutely sure that some of Africa's biggest failures will be countries that were amongst those widely expected to make it. While some of the biggest positive successes, as with South Korea and Singapore, will be countries that were widely written off as basket cases. Two of our cities are in Ghana, and we have very close political and policy relationships there. For years, I've been suggesting to Ghanaian leaders that despite, despite their um, strong democratic legacy and their vast hydrocarbon discoveries, economic growth would eventually stutter without more aggressive reform. Sadly, growth has now fallen from 15% in 2011 to 4% this year, and Ghana is now dependent on financial support from the IMF. In contrast, Cote d'Ivoire, a recently war-torn and poverty-stricken neighbour of Ghana's, is growing at close to double digits and is attracting considerable attention from international investors. In other words, Africa is definitely going to have its Chile's and Taiwan's. It will also have its Argentina's and probably, but hopefully not, it's North Korea's. The question is, what countries will fall into each of these categories? So over 30 to 40 years, what will be the cumulative impact of success or failure as an African emerging market? It will be massive and it will be transformational. Many tens of thousands of dollars of additional per capita GDP ending extreme poverty, up to 20 years in additional life expectancy, many millions of lives saved through re reduced infant mortality and eradicating diseases of poverty, a highly, educated work a highly educated workforce, and a vastly reduced risk of insecurity from terrorists and extremists. The, states, the stakes could hardly be higher. Against this background, let's take a look at East Africa and how Kenya is performing from a regional perspective. 
the next slide shows Kenyan growth in 2014 declined to 5.3%. That's roughly half of the 10.3% growth achieved by Ethiopia, considerably slower than Rwanda and Tanzania and slightly ahead of Uganda. In terms of corruption, as measured by Transparency International's Corruption Index, in 2014, Kenya ranked 145th, down nine places from the previous year, far behind Rwanda and Ethiopia, slightly behind Tanzania and Uganda, and amazingly, only marginally ahead of the Central African Republic. Kenya's overall business climate, as measured by the World Bank's 2015 Ease of Doing Business Survey, ranks Kenya as 136th in the world, well behind Rwanda, behind Ethiopia and Tanzania, and slightly ahead of Uganda. But more frightening, as this slide shows, is that Kenya's ranking has been steadily deteriorating, while that of strongly performing African economies has been going in the opposite direction. Like anyone getting a poor grade, it's perhaps tempting to argue that the surveys underpinning these data are inaccurate or even irrelevant. And that would simply be a cop-out. High levels of per capita income and high rates of investment required to drive growth simply don't happen in countries with hostile business environments and extreme levels of corruption. And this is exactly what we see when we compare foreign direct investment flows into Kenya with those in the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. As the next table shows, Kenya's FDI relative to GDP is exceptionally low compared to the continent and especially the rest of East Africa. The other me East, major East African economies have FDI to GDP ratios that are between twice, two and a half, and six times higher than that of uh, Kenya. The good news is that President Kenyatta is clearly not happy or complacent about Kenya's 5.3% growth rate or the current levels of corruption. His leadership and courage in confronting the issues of corruption head on is one of the most encouraging signs that Kenya has the potential to address the various obvious issues that are preventing Kenya from becoming one of Africa's star economies rather than an also-ran. But in a true democracy, such as you have in Kenya, one man, no matter how talented, can only do so much. Without resolve across civil society and the business community to push for reform and modernisation, Kenya is much, much more likely to be a Philippines or a Burma rather than a South Korea. And given Kenya's strategic location, flourishing democracy, sophisticated workforce and excellent resource endowment, this wasted opportunity would be a tragedy of the highest proportions for Kenyans and Kenya. And this brings me to Tartu City, the, opposite, the opportunities it presents and what its experience says about the investment climate in Kenya. As Ali Khan mentioned, I'm the CEO of Rendeva, which is the largest the controlling shareholder in Tartu. By way of background, Rendeva is the largest urban developer in Africa with a portfolio of 30,000 acres across Ghana, Nigeria, DRC, Kenya, and Zambia. We're building seven city-sized developments. Essentially, what we do is we buy raw land, often quite distant from the closest major conurbation, we master plan an entire new city, and then we install all requisite bulk infrastructure. This is funded with our own capital and without subsidies, and includes all high voltage electricity, roads, water, sewerage, and a variety of social amenities. We then either sell developed land, or as is frequently the case, work with the developers to build houses, apartments, light industrial facilities, or commercial real estate. A typical project for a Rendeva encompasses 2,500 acres and provides housing for 80,000 residents. And because of the scale, affordable housing is often the biggest component of our developments. Every country in which we operate has a dearth of modern infrastructure and a massive and growing housing deficit. You probably don't need reminding that Kenya currently has a housing deficit of 2 million units, which is growing at about 200,000 each year that goes by. Our business model is targeted precisely at these gaps. 
And because of our scale, we can de deliver big and efficient but affordable solutions. We generally find that we're targeting a scale and a niche that is too challenging for other private sector players and beyond the resources of governments. In other words, Rendeavour builds and pays for the infrastructure for entire new cities. We do this without subsidies in situations where without our involvement, no city would be built. In all of our work, we've learned through very hard experience and mistakes to shun what I might call utopian models of urban development. Rather, we endeavour to create urban templates that are, are as responsive as possible to the social and economic needs, capabilities and aspirations of the local communities in which we work. Tadu City itself is a 20-year project that is unique in vision, scale and quality, with plans for homes for 80,000 residents and 30,000 day visitors Tartu City will provide tens of thousands of jobs in Nairobi. A great majority of the housing units at Tartu City will be affordable homes and apartments priced from as little as 25,000 US dollars. And to give you an idea of Tartu City's size and scale, permit, permit me to f present a few figures. Over $500 million of infrastructure investment, 3.2 million square metres of res residential developments, 130,000 square metres in the business corridor, 230,000 square metres in our technology park, over 200,000 square metres of parks, playgrounds and green areas, over 75,000 square metres for hospitals and medical facilities, 650,000 square metres in what will be the largest industrial park in East Africa, and 445,000 square metres for school sites. Tartu City is unprecedented in Kenyan history. Our sole objective with Tartu City is to build a city that will redefine the scale and quality of urban development in Kenya, and to do so with our own land and without government subsidies. To repeat, to build a city is our sole objective. The good news is that much of Tartu's core infrastructure has been put in place over the past five years. I'm also delighted to report that we've built very strong partnerships with the many Kenyan companies building new state-of-the-art industrial facilities at Tartu City. Tartu City is well on the way to having the leading industrial park in East Africa. In addition, we are preparing several large-scale housing developments with a heavy emphasis on affordable homes and apartments. However, I'm sure that the audience in this room tonight does read the Kenyan media, so you are all well aware of the frustrations we've experienced over the last five years. Sadly, Tartu City is a case study on, the why, on why the investment environment and foreign investment is so poor in Kenya. So what happened at Tartu City? Our so-called Kenyan partners, Vimal Shah, Nyasha Nyaga, and Stephen McGuiru, have been masquerading as major shareholders with a great deal of influence over Tartu City when in fact their shareholding is virtually non-existent. They've invested virtually nothing in the project. Out of all of them, Vimal Shah is the only tiny, tiny invested investor and he has funded less than 0.3% of the project. All of the balance of over $100 million has been funded by myself and my American and international partners. And while Mr. Shah and Mr. Nyaga round, run around Nairobi today deviously acting the victimised investors, we continue to pay their workers and fund 100% of the ongoing infrastructure spend at Tartu City. Moreover, Mr. Shah, Mr. Nyaga and Mr. Maguiru have spent the last four years trying to sabotage Tartu City through spurious and fraudulent manipulation of the Kenya judicial system. On numerous occasions over this period, their legal representatives have sought cash payments and or land transfers from us ostensibly to make the problems go away in an ex explicit extortion or shakedown. In January 2013, after more than two years of courtroom drama, we received a resounding decision from Justice Masinga throwing M Mr. Maguero's allegations out of the Kenyan courts and ordering that out of a share capital of 1,570,000 shares, his one share and his mother's one share 
be bought out by the majority shareholders. Justice Singer stated, quote, the court must decline the invitation made by McGuero. McGuero is acting unreasonably by seeking to have the companies wound up so as to force a buyout on his terms. The, the Honourable Justice Masinga chose his words carefully, but I think we all understand what acting unreasonably by seeking to have the companies wound up so as to force a buyout on his terms actually means. Mr McGuero's two-year unsuccessful effort to extort us certainly, certainly didn't help him, but he did manage to hurt the image of Tartu City and to stop a great deal of infrastructure investment. He also managed to send a very negative signal to international investors about infrastructure investment. If you invest in Kenya infrastructure, expect to be criminally extorted and don't expect timely protection from the courts or the authorities. In 2015, we are once again being subject to vexatious legal actions and harassment, this time by Mr Shah and Mr Nyaga. Again, this is a blatant attempt at extortion. I'm one of the largest, perhaps the largest, individual investors in Kenya. I've made a 20-year commitment to invest in one of Kenya's least sexy but most critical sectors, urban infrastructure. Incredibly, in the last few months, I've been harassed by immigration officials and called in for questioning without any legal justification, as have other colleagues of mine. In my 25-year career in emerging markets, working in some pretty tough locations. This is a very unpleasant first for me. And Mr Nyaga is behind this pathetic low-level obstruction. The latest harassment was this afternoon when a group of policemen and immigration officials demanded entry to our office while, was re while Rendeva was holding a board meeting. Perhaps they thought they'd put me off coming here this afternoon. Hardly an encouragement to hold a board meeting or base your head office. In Nairobi. We've tried to replace Mr Nyaga as chairman of Tartu City with a highly respected Kenyan businessman, Mr Pius Ngugi, who was an old friend of mine. We tried to place, replace Mr Nyaga because of his incompetence, but also because we had reservations about his honesty and his integrity. Sadly, perhaps tragically, these concerns have been vindicated in a rather extreme fashion, and it is clear that he has now orchestrated a massive criminal conspiracy to steal 9 billion Kenyan shillings of land from us. In the latest and most extraordinary example of fraudulent activity, Mr Nyaga has orchestrated a massive fraud and theft by transferring over $100 million of our land from Tartu, Tartu City to his family members and employees. We filed a very strong case about, against Mr Nyaga and we believe that the Kenyan judicial system will act quickly and fairly to deal with this matter. This large-scale fraud has serious criminal implications for the perpetrators and the functionaries within different government agencies who have helped to commit the crime. We've turned over the evidence to the police and we've filed a criminal complaint. We believe that people will be convicted and go to jail. And let me tell you, we are absolutely determined to use the justice system to bring the criminals who have acted against us to justice. We're definitely not prepared to stand by in a situation where high profile people in the community are able to sweep massive crimes under the carpet and go, un and, and go unpunished. And perhaps it's a first for you to hear a foreign investor talk like that, but you don't come to invest $100 million and not bat your corner very vigorously to the very end, and that is exactly what we are doing. We view Mr Shah as a co-conspirator in Mr Nyaga's $100 million theft, because as mentioned above, he is fighting us in court to ensure Mr Nyaga, the fraudster, remains chairman of the board of Tartu City. Put simply, Mr Shah is an enabler of Mr Nyaga's fraudulent actions. And this is an extreme act of hypocrisy from someone who has the gall to masquerade in the international community as a champion for transparency and foreign investment. Well, Mr Shah, the international community is about to find out who you really are. Tartu City has the potential to be the largest single investment project in Kenya. 
Moreover, we're putting desperately needed, highly sought after infrastructure into the ground, paid for with our own capital. We're not short-term investors taking away Kenya's resources out of the ground. We're doing exactly the opposite. The international investment community is now closely watching the developments surrounding Tartu City. Because these crimes are not just big by Kenyan standards, they're big by African and international standards. Naturally, we're also seeking redress in international courts, which we have resort to, as well as informing the countries of our investors, the United States, Britain, Norway and New Zealand, of the difficulties, difficulties we're having. If it's possible to block a project as large and strategic as Tartu, the great majority of foreign investors will conclude that Kenya is simply too risky for investment and will focus on other, other African countries with a more welcoming investment climate. So why are Mr Shah and Mr Nyaga behaving the way they are? For the very simple reason that they think they can extort us and get away with it. They think they can tie us up in court and use administrative means to frustrate us to an extent that will pay them to go away. And Kenya's corruption ranking and neg negligible foreign investment tell us why they think they can get away with it. Well, I have news for Mr Shah and Mr Nyaga. Having invested more than $100 million of our own capital into a 20-year project, we're not going to be extorted by them or anyone else. And we're quite accustomed to operating in much more challenging environments with much more challenging people than these characters. Moreover, <laughs> we will use all legal, official and informal avenues at our disposal within Kenya and internationally to call these people to account, to make them accountable for the damage that they have done to the project and the investment climate. Mr Nyaga has an added motive. He's got nothing to lose by damaging Tartu. He's invested nothing, and in any interest he may have had in Tartu has been diluted down to a negligible amount through capital increases in Mauritius by his former partner, Steve McGuiru. Extortion is his only chance for profit. To state the very obvious, Tartu City is a litmus test for Kenya's investment climate and future prosperity. If a project of this size and quality, with the backing of incredibly committed investors, is blocked, Kenya will effectively be excluded from the benefits of large-scale foreign investment. More generally, if Kenya's corruption and ease of doing business performance don't improve materially, Kenya will definitely not be a middle-income country or a high-growth country. In other words, Kenya will be a Burma rather than what it could be in a South Korea. This will be a horrendous price to pay by millions of Kenyans for decades to come. But think also of the direct costs of the delays to Tatu. In every other country we operate, we're now well into our second project. If we're endeavour to build two Tatu cities in Kenya, this alone would reduce Kenya's housing deficit by 8% and create in excess of 50,000 jobs without the government spending a shilling. Thankfully, the Kenyan president is shining a light on the path towards reduced corruption and improved governance. However, as I said before, civil society and the business community have an, have an equally important role to play. If you want prosperity for your country, you must demand more from your institutions and you must fight for change. And you need to have the courage to name and shame powerful individuals who sub subvert democracy and the ju judicial system for their ill-gotten gain. The entire community loses if the business community co tolerates crooks who masquerade as businessmen. Personally, I am a believer in Kenya. In fact, it's obvious, I'm a massive believer, which is why I've made such an enormous personal and financial commitment to such a long-term project. I truly believe that Kenya can be one of the great success stories over the next 20 years, not just in Africa, but globally. But this will only happen if we all work together to stamp out corruption and modernise institutions to create an environment that leads to prosperity and development for all Kenyans. Thank you for your support and we very much look forward to working with you in the years to come.
Thank you. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> who's going to ask the first question <laughs> after that? <laughs>